Uh, it's my pleasure. Here to uh, introduce the, today's uh, seminar speaker, Jason Hunt. Uh, he got his PhD from UCL in 2015, then worked for about half a year for uh, Gaia Deepak. Mm -hmm. uh, then he moved here to Toronto as a Douglas Fellow and got awarded uh, the Paul Weave um, Fellowship for Research on Innovation uh, so he's here to talk to us today about uh, galaxy motion ripples, and spirals in the Milky Way. Um, thank you, Jason. Great. Thanks, Nij. It's nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, yeah, I'm Jason Hunt from the CCA, um, mainly working on kind of galactic scale astrophysics, both with large survey data, but also with high resolution simulations. And as I get started, just want to give you a little bit of perspective. Um, we know the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy, but we certainly don't have uh, the full view of its structure and dynamics because of our like location within the disk. We can't look out and see on the sky the Milky Way in all its glory. We instead get this view, which is very beautiful in its own right, but much harder to interpret owing to complex observational selection effects such as the dust extinction and survey selection functions um, that occur because of our position within the galaxy. However, there are also advantages to this. The Milky Way is only the real system where we have the opportunity to explore the 3D positions, motions, and chemistry of individual stars. And we can use that as a kind of a Rosetta Stone to hopefully understand what's going on in galaxies across the universe. But we always need more surveys to give us more data. And we also really need uh, sophisticated computational modeling and analysis techniques to help us take full advantage of that data and compensate for the observational biases and the selection effects and see further across the disk. So a great survey we've had recently, this is Gaia. Uh, it's the main one that I've been working with, launched back in December, 2013, uh, ESA's Cornerstone mission. And it was originally pitched to map 1 billion stars in our galaxy and to cost about $1 billion. So for every dollar you spend, you get one star's worth of information, um, which is catchy, but in the end, we're actually doing way better than that. It's now observed about 1.8 billion stars. So way ahead of kind of the like star budget. Uh, it's also very well complemented by ground-based surveys, uh, such as the SPSS Apogee and Milky Way Mapper, because Gaia is optical and it provides mainly astrometry. So anything that can provide you uh, spectroscopic information, whether radio velocities or abundances, it's great. And anything in the infrared that can cut through the dust helps us probe other parts of the galaxy that Gaia isn't optimized for. So just a little summary of um, what Gary has given us so far, 1.8 billion stars. There's also plenty of solar system objects, quasars, et cetera, but I'm mainly interested in the stars. And out of those 1.8 billion, it provides astrometry. So this is position on the sky, parallax, which gives you distance and the proper motion. So for about 1.5 billion, so that's 5D information. The missing sixth dimension is the radial velocity, which is the velocity towards and away from us, which we only get for about 33 million, which is a massive decrease from 1.5 billion. Um, however, that those 33 million stars will have the full six dimensional phase space information. And the 60 sample has been particularly exciting to me. So this is back from Gaia DR2. Actually, then there are only 7 million. It's gone up since then. But it gave us the first real opportunity to start mapping uh, kinematics across the disk of the Milky Way. So we have here on the top left, a map of galactocentric radial velocity. So this is the velocity from which stars are moving inwards and outwards in the galaxy, uh, X and Y. So this is just looking down on the plane of the disk. And then in the bottom panel, V phi, which is the rotation velocity, the speed with which stars are orbiting the galaxy round and round. And what you can see here is this quite significant substructure. Red are stars moving outwards, blue is a star moving inwards. Red are stars moving faster than the average local circular speed and blue are stars moving slower. So I'm not going to dig into these features specifically. Uh, these are also the dispersions on the right. But you can see that there is rich substructure here. Uh, it's, we're not perfectly smooth, as it would be if the galaxy was actually symmetric and flat and peaceful. Um, but then we kind of knew that already, because we are a bad spiral galaxy. But this is the first time we can make those large scale multi kiloparsec maps. And as I said before, Gary is well complemented by the spectroscopic surveys such as Apogee. So here's a map from your own Henry Lung, grad student in Toronto, um, who won combining Gaia with Apogee through his Astro and N neural network code. We really pick out the kinematics of the galactic bar. So this is now data that reaches all the way at the galactic center. You can see the quadrupole here picked out very nicely. But there are a lot fewer stars in Gaia, sorry, in Apogee compared to Gaia. So we don't get quite the same detail in the area that Gaia can see, but perfectly complementary. 
Oh, and this is also a point to say, whenever you see one of these little heads in a red box, they're one of my collaborators on the papers that have been shown in this work. So they will pop up from time to time, um, as does the next one, uh, Daisuke, who is my old PhD advisor. So right after Gaia DR2, we get this six-dimensional subset for the first time. Immediately afterwards, a day or two later, there's two papers in the archive, one from Daisuke and myself, one from Teresa and Toya in Barcelona, that show the discovery of these ridges or ripples in the distribution of galactocentric radius, this is how far they are from the galactic center, R, versus the rotation velocity V phi. And you see this, again, the space is not smooth. You have ridges that Daisuke has picked out with these diagonal lines. They're also very evident in Teresa's plot as these diagonal uh, ridges and overdensities. Daisuke links them to spiral arms. Teresa links them to bar resonance and satellite impact. Um, I'm going to show them both as they come out together. And we actually, these are kind of large extensions of the classical known solar neighborhood moving groups that have been seen all the way back by Holland Egan at the end of the 50s. Uh, he thought it might have been dissolving star clusters and there were other explanations back then. We now know that they are large scale dynamical features in the disk that are likely created by some kind of galactic dynamical process. There's far too many stars and they stretch far too far to be dissolving clusters. Also, the chemistry doesn't match. So just for an example, Sirius here, it's a picture of rate of, sorry, graph of radio velocity versus rotation velocity. This ridge here is Sirius, stretching over at least five kiloparsecs. These trimodal Hercules stream are these little ridges at the bottom here. And this strong ridge at the top is what we sometimes call the hat, though it doesn't come out too cleanly in this space. Yes, go ahead, Chris. But these features are connected with well-known star clusters. They are only named after a prominent star in the group. So although, sorry, is that not your question? Oh. So when it, it's called the Hyades because this here is the Hyades cluster and it's in this group of co-moving stars. What I'm getting at, I guess, is that the question is, are these kinematic features in some way connected also with gas and they can help stimulate star formation? If you make these kind of, um, like the RV firing gas, you get a much thinner band. There, it's it's different. There, there's some correlation with gas structure, but it's not all from star forming regions. They are so like many of these will be old stars that have not recently formed out of gas that are being shepherded as some dynamical process. They will talk through the possibilities for that. So it's not saying there will be zero connection with the gas structure, but they're not just forming out of the gas in these co-moving groups. Yeah. And along with these RV firing structure like this, Teresa Antoya also discovered in the same paper, the striking spiral pattern or snail-shaped pattern in Z versus VZ. So you have here along the x-axis Z, this is the height above and below the disk plane. VZ, this is the motion up and down above the disk plane uh, for a comparatively local sample of stars in the solar neighborhood. This is a density map and you can just about make out this spiral or snail shape. This is coloring those by rotor velocity. You see a bit of structure, but it's not very clean. And if you look in, if you color the space by the azimuth of velocity v phi, you get quite a striking uh, snail-shaped spiral pattern in the position of motion of stars above and below the disk plane. And we see all these features in simulations. Um, and then if we're, we can use the simulations to try and work out what's going on to show us in the real data. Simulations help us like look at the entire galaxy. We're no longer limited by a little local range. We can try and link what we see in the data back to the dynamical effects that are causing them. They are, of course, not ground truth and must always be confronted by data. There's always things we could be doing wrong in our simulations, but qualitatively, we have quite a good reproduction of these type of features, but not quantitatively. And so as some examples, these ridges in RV5 that I was talking about are made pretty naturally by a galactic bar, inducing them by resonances. Not going to talk too much about resonances today, but here's an example, barred and body model from Francesca Frangudi. It's a contour plot. You see the same ridge. Uh, shaped structures in this R versus V phi plane. And when she colors them by radial velocity, you get a red blue flip at the bar resonance here. And there's plenty of other radial velocity substructure in here. However, these ridges can also be made pretty easily by galactic spiral arms. This is a paper I did with Joe while I was in Toronto. Yet another different projection of this space, R V phi. Again, you see the ridges. This time it stretches a lot further because I'm combining Gara and Apogee together. But in my model, the spiral arms, you also get a lot of ridges just cropping up naturally from the way that the spiral arms perturb the stars in the disk and they mix back up again. And the combination can be difficult to dis disentangle if you have both going on at the same time. 
So here's an example movie with an undergrad who was actually a SERP student here back in the day, Matthew Bubb, now grad student at Perimeter, who ran a simulation of a featureless test particle disk where we turn on a galactic bar and then we add some spiral arms to it later. So when there's a bar alone, we'll let this evolve, the bar is being grown, and we start to see this red-blue feature here in the middle. It's quite easy to pick out. Um, we know that's the outer limb blood resonance of the bar, and if we know where it is, we can then use that to make measurements of properties of the bar and, and of the galaxy in general. But if we then turn on the spiral structure, wait for it, suddenly it becomes quite the mess, and actually picking out which of these many features would be the bar resonance and using it to make interesting measurements is suddenly much more difficult. You can certainly pick one, and we know that it's this one here because we saw the earlier version of this plot without the spirals. But if you don't know which of these features actually corresponds to the bar and you try and make a measurement, you can get totally the wrong number. Um, so it's this is more a cautionary tale and was um, something I always feel is worth pointing out. And just to make life more difficult, if you have a satellite interacting with the disk, you also make these ridges again. Some M-body model from Shervin Laporte, yet another projection of the same space in the Gaia data, RV5, you see the diagonal ridges. And he hits an M-body disk with a satellite. And again, you get these ridges as the galaxy phase mixes back up following the, the collision. This is maybe less of a completely distinctive case because actually the satellite induces a lot of tidal spiral arms. So you could claim this is kind of the same as the spiral structure. But whether they arise self-consistently within the disk or are induced by a satellite, spiral arms naturally reproduce these ridges. And the advantage of the satellite explanation is such a satellite impact also creates these ZVZ phase spirals or snails that we saw. So again, in the top row, we have the guide data from Therese Antoya in 2018. And on the bottom, these are the phase spirals that are generated from Shervin Laporte's merger simulation a little later on. And now they're not in density. These are colored by the azimuthal velocity because this is the only way he could pick them out. We are now really in a regime where the Gaia data is so far beyond what we can do with our simulations in terms of like number counts in local density. Um, well, it's a completely complete regime change from what we were doing uh, several years ago. But Sherman's model is also kind of old by this point, back from 2017, and we can do much better with updated computing hardware and uh, state-of-the-art codes that leverage stuff such as GPUs. So as an example, I'm going to present one of the models that I ran uh, last year in 2021, now at a billion particles. Um, which sounds cool, but it's mainly just because we really want to resolve that local phase space information and we want higher force resolution for when we're doing these tests. So this is going to be the top left surface density of the disk. I should use my arrow for the people on Zoom. Top left surface density on the disk, top middle radial velocity. So this will show coherent motion of stars moving in and out in the galaxy. This is edge on density on the top right. Bottom left is Z, so height, mean height above and below the disk plane. VZ mean velocity above and below the plane. And on the right, you're only going to see the satellite. In these four panels, the satellite's going to be represented by a green dot as it comes through. And on the right, you'll see all the particles that are representing it in the simulation. And you can see at the moment, Z, VZ, and VR, so all mean, are basically flat and featureless. Their mean is effectively zero. This is a very smooth and stable galaxy. I took the initial conditions from uh, Widger and Dubinsky's 2005 paper. So it's not designed to perfectly reproduce the Milky Way. It's designed to stay stable. So it's not so much Milky Way-like, but it's a great laboratory for exploring what happens only induced by the merger because it won't generate a bar and spiral structure naturally. So I set this going, a little bit of initial condition instability, but you don't see large scale coherent structure in the kinematics until the satellite is about to come by, which is gonna happen at about 2.4 gig years in a few seconds, there it goes. And you see following the passage, you generate a lot of spiral structure and the face on uh, surface density. You also create a lot of coherent radial velocity, vertical velocity, and vertical structure during that first passage. Then it comes in again. You get uh, much more spiral structure and kinematic features induced on top of the previous round. And each time the satellite spirals in, as it gets further and further, you get more and more substructure and more and more kind of chaotic dynamics as the first passage looked really clean. I'm going to let this go through once more just to break one other point. Um, this is the bit where we wait for it to come back. Any minute now, satellite comes through. You see in the first instance, everything is super clean. This is partially because this disk is pretty warm. It doesn't collapse a lot under its own um, self-gravity. But in the later passages, the thing I wanted to highlight 
was up here on the right, we pull up a lot of these uh, like feathers in the outer disk, which are actually seen in a lot of the surveys today. So it seems like a natural indication that these kind of things are induced by satellite mergers. Um, and as it goes on later and later, you get more and more vertical substructure. And as I said, this is not designed to perfectly reproduce the Milky Way. And I'm still going to choose a present day snapshot and compare it to the Milky Way because I can. And this is chosen such that the satellite here is in about the same position as the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy today. But I do want to stress it's not meant to reproduce the Sag Milky Way system. This satellite is too heavy. It's also a bit too close in, but like it's qualitatively the closest <clears throat> that this system would ever get to the Milky Way Sag one. And from here, we can examine the snapshot. This is work done by my undergrad from Columbia, Joanna. Um, if we look in the simulation, yeah, again, we get all these ridges in RV5, as we saw before in Sherwin. We shouldn't be surprised at this point, uh, which matches Gaia. We also get a phase spiral. Again, it qualitatively matches. It doesn't quantitatively match, but it's not the same system. That's fine. And more surprisingly to me, I really wasn't expecting this to come out. We actually get a pretty good reproduction of the old classical moving groups to the extent that this like secondary mode Hercules, the, the kind of triple moded main part of the velocity substructure, even with the little hook of Sirius. And then we get actually two stronger hat feature as it's now known compared to the real data. But like quantitative, it's a good match. And the weird part about this is this hat is often linked to the outer limb blood resonance of the bar, but our present day snapshot, it has no bar. So this would be a difficult thing to, to reconcile there. Uh, I just want to make the point that these can be like generically generated. I'm not claiming that we've somehow got the right answer for the Milky Way system. It just happens to pop up that the, the dynamics look kind of similar. And so for a while now, I'm just going to focus on the phase spiral or the snail. And this is present day a snapshot of this galaxy, taking everything within a one kiloparsec, a little ring near our position of the sun, which is on the far side of the galaxy from the satellite, which is represented by the green dot. We get a phase spiral. And I'm going to digress briefly to explain why these form to help those of us who are not a galactic dynamicist. So firstly, stars are orbiting the galaxy. They go round and round. They also go in and out. They have radial eccentricity. Most orbits are not perfectly circular. And they also go up and down. They have vertical eccentricity. So as they're going round and round and in and out, they're also going up and down. And we have a few little toy orbit examples. This is all taken from Wilmotrix's PhD thesis. Three orbits. There's a little orange orbit, which is perfectly circular in the XY space, the blue one, which has a bit more radial eccentricity, and the green one, which has even more radial eccentricity. These are all pretty close to circular. And then if you're looking in R versus VR, they would progress slowly around the orbits in this space. So as they, the orange one has no radial eccentricity, it sets at the center of this, its R is fixed and it has no VR. The blue one goes a little bit further, it reaches from like 8.1 and a half here. And when it's on the pericenter, we'll have a velocity of around five kilometers per second. And the green one further, it makes the larger outer ring in this space because uh, it reaches larger radii and has a larger VR as it goes through pericenter. And the same is true in the vertical case. The orange orbit, while it has no radial eccentricity, is going up and down as it goes round. So it sits somewhere in the middle of this Z versus VZ space. You see it reaches 0.1 kiloparsec in these plots. And the blue one has both radial and vertical eccentricity. So it's going round and round in both these spaces. And it's also to do with the frequencies of these things. So the further you are from the center of this plot, the higher, we call it vertical action, there's dynamicists. And the further out you are here, the lower your frequency. So in the same way you imagine in the, real, in the galaxy, stars that are in the middle of the Milky Way go round and round much faster than stars in the outskirts. We know that so is true in this space of Z and VZ. So this little green orbit, if it had any vertical motion at all, would be oscillating really quickly. The orange one will be oscillating a bit slower than that, and the blue one even slower as it follows its track around the space. And on top of that, the frequencies in general are higher the closer you are to the center of the galaxy. So your vertical frequency, you oscillate up and down faster if you're near the center of the galaxy than you do further out. So this little panel on the top right is galactocentric radius versus frequency. And so for a, in, in the inner parts of the galaxy, the frequencies are higher, but also the higher your, your vertical action, the kind of your distance to the center of this space, the lower your frequency. So you get this kind of, this pattern in this plot. And then from there, if we have our ZVZ space, you imagine for a second that this is a nice uniform sphere. They go around and around on these orbits. 
the ones that are further out move slower, but it doesn't matter because everything is um, smooth and phase mixed, so no, no distortion happens in this little picture here. However, if you kick it out of equilibrium, such as the disk being perturbed by a passing satellite, in the simple version of this explanation, these stars will all continue going round and round the circular orbits that are like drawn on here, even though now this distribution is not in equilibrium. And so over time, this density sphere will get kind of smeared out around these orbits into a circle. In practice, it's not quite this simple, which I'll talk about briefly later, but that's the kind of toy explanation if you're not used to looking at these phase spirals as to what's going on. And we're interested in this because the spirals uh, contain some information about our galaxy. This is a study, Axel Widmark did a first couple of papers and then he asked to test it on my simulation that I've just shown you. And going in blind, he showed that his method to recover the vertical one dimensional potential from a little subset uh, from this data, this is not even a particularly strong spiral, it doesn't even come out very well on the projector, but there is a spiral in there. And using the properties of that spiral, he can recover the 1D vertical density profile. It works pretty well if he knows the shape of the potential, but and is just fitting for magnitude. It's a bit harder if you don't know the shape as well, which we don't really. And if we know the potential, then we can unwind the spirals back. We can calculate the frequencies of our stars, and we can start to unwrap something that we see either in the simulation or in the real guide data. This is a study we're doing with Stanford grad student Elise Derek Ford that should be out fairly soon, and giving her this spiral from a pretty simplified uh, model of a satellite interacting with a disk, she can unwind this back to the original offset perturbation and pull out a pretty good interaction time. But again, this works well when the model is simple and it's actually not quite this simple. Just going back to my little diagram here, when this ball of stars is kicked off center, these stars also contribute to the self-gravity in this region. So they're no longer going to actually orbit around the original zero zero point of this mid plane it's perturbed off slightly that is something we still need to actually capture in our models we're not there yet so i'm not going to talk about it too much beyond this but that is like the next stage there's probably some lag time when they're happily orbiting with themselves in their new equilibrium until they start to mix with other stars and that center uh, moves back again but anyway another way that it's not quite that simple is actually that this uh, local volume so this is the, the ZBZ phase spiral now seen from Gaia DR3 from my 2022 paper. Uh, so now in the density, we can pick it out pretty cleanly or, well, this is density mean weight of density subtracted, but it still comes out pretty cleanly. And um, this actually contains stars on many different orbits. Like I showed with the cartoon from Wilma Trick's thesis, you have stars in the solar neighborhood that are on circular orbits, but you also have lots of stars that are visiting the solar neighborhood from the inner galaxy on eccentric orbits and similarly stars from the outer galaxy that are visiting the solar neighborhood on eccentric orbits, but from the other direction. And so if you split our local sample of stars by angular momenta to kind of divide them back out to where the, the guiding centers of their orbits would be, you actually find the spirals look kind of different. We're dominated by the ones that are close to circular because there are more stars that are close to circular in like this main image, but the morphology of the spiral changes from low angular momenta to high angular momenta. You might not be able to tell the difference between a couple of panels next to each other, but if you go all the way from the left to the right, the difference becomes clear. And the region that this is interesting in turn is because they actually probe other regions of the disk or probing like areas with different orbital history. So this is another simulation from a uh, graduate student Columbia Sirog Gandhi we were working with. And if she takes her test particle simulation, takes a little solar neighborhood today, does the same split in angular momenta, you see even more varied um, forms of these phase spirals. The one on the left is pretty tightly wound. The one on the right is not so wound which fits with the discussion of frequencies I was giving before. Stars that spend their time in the inner galaxy with lower angular momenta have higher frequencies and so have wound up more in the same period. And the ones in the galaxy have not wound up as much. The other interesting point here is that the green and orange lines for the kind of intermediate angular momenta seem to have less of a contrast in their spirals than the ones from the blue, purple, and red groups. And if we trace these back to where the stars were at the time when the satellite interacted with the galaxy, we can see why. So firstly, the red group was indeed further out as befit its current angular momenta. The interesting part, this big red blob in the background of the disk is where the satellite punched through the galaxy. So these red group, the purple group and the blue group were actually pretty close to the interaction. So they got a much larger kick 
than the green and orange groups, which were a little bit over the further side of the disk. So our hope is that if we can like fully analyze and exploit these space barrels, that we can get information not only on when the galaxy was perturbed, but also the geometry of it. And just as an aside, again, when I said a given volume contains many spirals, you have the split by angular momenta from stars that are visiting from the inner and outer galaxy. But the epicycle, you can also split it by what we dynamicists call theta phi, or the conjugate phase angle for the azimuthal action. Um, for those of you who are not dynamicists, what this means is with stars in their epicycles move kind of ahead and behind their guiding center over their radial epicycle. So this is splitting stars by whether they predominantly spend more of their time ahead or behind the sun in like their orbits. So you can then use these two things together to make, um, well, this is another little illustration, doing it now on my big simulation for the billing particles I showed the animation for. This is the face barrel we get within one kiloparsec. If you go out to three or five kiloparsecs in the solar neighborhood, you can really start to see the superposition of many spirals and everything is looks messy. If you then decompose the local spiral by angular momenta and by uh, theta phi, you get the kind of range of different spirals that we were seeing from Soror and from the Gaia data. Now, even a billion particles is starting to get to the point where we see a lot of noise in this space. We don't have enough stars, we can't compete with Gaia. But doing this split does allow us to make this kind of 2D map of stars over a wide range of guiding radii. So like right in the middle would be the average location of the sun. To the left is closer to the stars that spend more of their time in the inner galaxy. On the right, the stars that spend their time in the outer galaxy. And then top to bottom are stars that are, spend more of their time ahead or behind the sun. So you're kind of making a map physically across space, but it's not really the positions. It's more like the orbit structure. And the dynamicists will know that this introduces a radial action and radial phase dependence, which is discussed in our papers, but I'm mainly going to gloss over today just to say that I have thought about that. Um, but all of those spirals in that 2D split are contained within the local volume within one kiloparsec of our chosen solar position in the simulation. However, a great thing about simulations, as I said before, is we are not limited by selection effects. Guy, we can't see much further than this. With a simulation, we can see as far as we like. So now this plot on the right is showing what you would see as a local phase spiral if you lived at each point around this galaxy in one kiloparsec by one kiloparsec bins. So the one I showed you before is, I think, this one over here. But the main things I want you to take away from this plot are that these phase spirals are ubiquitous. They're across the entire face of the galaxy. Wherever you happen to be in the Milky Way, it would be there. Secondly, that the phase spirals near each other are comparatively similar if you look in a local range. But if you look over the far side of the galaxy, they're pretty much completely different because these stars have experienced the perturbations differently. They've had different orbital histories, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that you're all looking at this and thinking, wow, this plot really isn't information dense enough. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to add 750,000 more panels in the form of time evolution. So Remember, each of these little circles is a one kiloparsec by one kiloparsec box of what you would see if you lived there locally. And here's the movie from 2021. You see in the beginning, system is very stable. They're all nice and not entirely circular, but they are the shape they should be and they're doing their thing, no spirals at all. Satellite galaxy comes through about now. The whole distribution wobbles a bit as the, the distributions are pulled off center. And then over time, you see them all wind up into phase spirals. You know, propagating outwards at the moment. And now we're going to get the second interaction where everything wobbles again. And you get phase spirals induced on top of phase spirals. And then you get another interaction and it gets more and more chaotic and more and more messy as the satellite spirals further and further into the disk and you get more and more perturbations. Um, I get that you may not have got all of that on the first run through. So I'm going to pick out a couple of frames to freeze on. So this is right after the first passage we get this uh, nice ring of kind of two armed phase spirals that are also very regular. So pretty clean. They are however different in different parts of the galaxy. You see over here, they're closer to like fully wrapping on the circle. Over here, you have almost like it looks like a barred galaxy in the middle. But like next to each other, they were pretty similar. And then during the later passages, after you've had more mergers, you start to uh, introduce the one-armed phase spirals in the area of the galaxy that would be close to where the sun is, like you see in the solar neighborhood in here. 
and the outer disk is now pretty messy following multiple passages. And the reason why you get those one or two arms phase barrels is entirely owing to the nature of the interaction. The first passage is very quick and it's almost impulsive. You have your Milky Way disk flat like this. The satellite really whips past the end at quite a high distance. It actually goes past the galaxy quicker than the period that the stars are oscillating vertically. So really they don't have a chance to go very far during the entire interaction. This in induces what we call a breathing mode where stars above and below the disk plane are kind of going like that opposite even the orientation around each other. And this is because it, depending on the phase of the star vertically, it either really adds energy to its orbit or it takes it away depending on the orbital phase. Then the second and the later passages, again, you have your disk, the satellite coming in much more slowly. There's a long extended passage. The whole disk has a time to like bend down towards it. And this induces what we call as a bending mode where stars above and below the disk plane like this are going up and down together. So the bending mode is doing that. The breathing mode is doing that. And going back to my little simplistic toy, so the bending mode is the one you saw on the right already, where it gets pulled off center. The one on the left gets stretched as some stars gain energy and some stars lose energy, depending on the orbital phase. And then while the bending mode winds up as an M equals one disequilibria phase mixing event, the breathing mode winds up as an M equals two um, phase mixing. And this is all explained very nicely in Larry Widger's 2014 paper, not in terms of the spirals, but in the induction of the breathing and bending modes through various speed satellite interactions. So if you want to see more of the math, I recommend that paper. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to go with the toy example. And why am I talking about that? Because the Gaia spiral only has one arm. Why am I interested in two arms phase spirals? Well, I would say, firstly, the simulation has a one arm phase spiral on the local volume. Here's the Gaia data. Here's the simulation with its one arm phase spiral. But if I go back to this image, uh, I didn't mention it before, but actually in the outer disk, you still have some relics of the earlier two arm phase spirals. So this is kind of where I had my talk wrap up back in 2021, where I made the prediction that perhaps one day when we have future surveys that can take us further out across the galaxy, we may be able to find the relics of two arm phase spirals in the outer disk that would be interesting because they would tell us about an earlier part of a satellite interaction made potentially gig years ago in the Milky Way's history. And so, yeah. Milky Way may have breathing spirals further out beyond the current Gaia volume. I didn't expect to find them in Gaia DR3 because I thought that the, the increase in range from the data wasn't going to be very large. I was hoping that maybe we'd be able to pick them out with something in the future, such as Milky Way Mapper. However, then came DR3, and we discovered two arm phase spirals. Uh, however, although my prediction was correct kind of for the morphology and the phenomenology, I got the wrong place of where they were because I actually found them in the inner galaxy. And these phase spirals have two arms running down its inner column, and then in the kind of intermediate ones, they're a blend of the two. So, yeah, almost. And this is roughly the range that they cover. Nej has a nice plot that in the end I didn't get to include today, but I would love to steal for a future version of this plot, where the amplitude of the breathing mode kind of decreases for a few kiloparsecs interior of the sun, and the amplitude of the bending mode kind of goes upwards uh, on the outside of that. And we could actually have made this prediction before. Firstly, this, behave this morphological behavior was seen in Gaia DR2, uh, just no one noticed. And it was a lot closer to the noise. Um, but also some earlier studies in the Milky Way, such as from Williams with rave data and then Carillo later on with Gaia and rave together, did uh, find evidence for breathing mode in the inner galaxy. And these two arm phase spirals should be kind of generic um, results of breathing modes, whereas the one-armed ones are kind of the results of bending modes as they wind up and go back towards phase mixing towards equilibrium over time. But the frequencies don't work for this with the infall of a single satellite with the nice picture that I gave you a few slides ago. The stars in the inner galaxy oscillate vertically faster than stars in the outer galaxy. So it's not possible that a satellite can have been faster than the fast stars, but slower than the slow stars. That doesn't really work. So two things. One, my simple picture is wrong, which it could well be, and I'll happily discuss uh, later. Or we need another mechanism, which is the explanation I went through in my Gaia 3, DR3 release paper, where I looked at into some isolated disks to see if I could find phase spirals uh, without a satellite. So there was this model from Sergei Kopaskov, and I, I missed his citation, but it's uh, where if the bar buckles, you can introduce a vertical perturbation that then winds up as a phase spiral. Now, my simulations that tend to be high resolution, none of the bars buckled, but I still managed to find uh, phase spirals in the inner disk of these galaxies. 
which the, there is a bar and it grows to kind of slow resonant excitation. But actually, when I'm looking at these phase spirals, this is the inner disk. It's not that strong, but you can see this two armed phase spiral structure here. And in the outer disk, there's absolutely nothing. And as I was looking at where these arise, they kind of grow and decay periodically over the life of the simulation. And they look to be maybe more coupled to the, the growth and decay of the spiral arms as opposed to the bar. But this needs more work for me to actually home in on what's going on here. But with that simulation, I then took the initial condition and hit it with a satellite. And then in the outer disk, you do indeed have one arm bending spirals like we see in the Milky Way. So the two arm breathing spiral in the inner disk remains. Slightly different contrast actually gets a bit stronger. Well, the galaxy has now evolved differently post satellite interaction, but they are qualitatively similar. And the outer disk now has the one arm phase spiral, which is similar to the trend that we see in the Milky Way. So I suggest that this might be we're seeing the overlap of vertical disequilibria induced by um, like internal disk substructure, such as the Barnes spiral arms, and then in the outer disk, um, phase spirals that have been introduced by perturbation by a satellite. However, needs more work. The amplitude of the breathing mode is a bit lower than the amplitude of the bending mode, but it does like change with radius. I think I can actually, Nej might be able to draw this better than me, but if I have, is there any, no, I can't draw. I can't draw this thing. Chalk, chalk right over there? Yeah. So roughly if you have, uh, and then, is alpha the m equals two kind of drops off like that and the m equals one i think it went saying up like that so the m equals one is much larger in the outer disk but at the area where they're crossing over they're kind of there's a point where they're equivalent and then in the inner disk the breathing mode gets stronger but never as large as the bending mode that we see in the outer disk except that we might just not be seeing it as far perhaps if you go further into the inner disk it might get even stronger um, as, as for phase i don't have the answer to that question immediately um, as you go kind of linearly along these panels, the phase changes slightly. So I think it's telling us something about where those stars were when the interaction originally happened. This is what I'm doing with the, the graduate student in Stanford, Elise Derek Ford, for the paper that should be coming out soon. And you can try and use the change in phase to wind them back and get a slightly different interaction time for stars that were in different places in the galaxy to try and learn about the the morphology of the perturbing influence because they should start to feel the interaction at slightly different times as the satellite comes through. Um, so what's making the spiral? I mostly glossed over this by now because it's to some degree an open question. When this was first discovered by Teresa Antonio in 2018, the kind of leading explanation people thought it would be the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. This is a dwarf galaxy that's currently merging into the Milky Way. It's on the far side of the galactic center uh, we can see the Sagittarius stream beautifully across the sky. Um, and it's probably like the most recent example of a merger of any decent size. Now I'm going to come back to that and talk about it in more details, but to quickly run through the other potential options. Magellanic clouds, almost certainly not because they're still in their first infall. It's very massive, so it is going to have a big effect on the Milky Way over time, and it's already destroying the halo. But it, although it's pulling on the disk, there hasn't been enough time for those to wind up in the phase spirals. It's just still on the first passage. Once it's gone really much further past pericenter. Um, I imagine that we will generate phase barrels from the LMC, but not there yet, and we're not going to be around to see it. Um, other options are any older mergers. If there's anything we've missed in the history of the Milky Way that we can't see, it's possible. Um, but if they're light enough that they're gone today, they probably don't have enough mass to induce uh, the phase barrel that we see. Someone suggested recently that it could be all the way back from the seven gig years ago, Gaia Enceladus, but that would be a long time for them to hang around. Um, so alternately, galactic bar, whether buckling from Kopitskov's model or resonant growth, or whether from spiral structure, it seems to be what's going on from my internal model. These are options, but nothing is proven. Um, we do need to do more analysis of the spirals themselves. Um, and yeah, so I'll talk briefly in my last few minutes about the options for the Sagittarius interaction. So Sagittarius galaxy is currently merging into the Milky Way. This is the location of the sun. This is where the galaxy is now in, in Eugene Vasiliev's 2020 simulation paper. Sag has come in like this. And it's now going to go up there. Um, and the question of what, what should it do to the disk, we looked at it in a few papers. So again, from Sura Gandhi, we showed one of hers earlier. You get this. If you only model the very last passage under the disk, you get this kind of red-blue asymmetry. This blue blob, our stars moving downwards, that are directly above 
the satellite galaxy. So it makes sense, they're being pulled down towards it. Stars on the other side that are red, they're moving upwards. That's because stars that were over here have had time to go down and start to go up again. So we thought that maybe we could see this kinematic imprint in the Milky Way today. And we found that even if we go back to earlier passages, this one on the left uh, has just that last passage. This one on the right has three passages. And you see, although there is more substructure in the one on the right, the overall global signature remains the same. So it was kind of dominated by the last passage. The problem being that it's also proportional to the mass of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. And so to get a VZ signature uh, similar to what we see in the real data, it's my favorite from Christina Eilers back a while ago, we can't see on the far side of the galaxy. So we, can never, we can't see this blue blob. We do get this red arc, which is qualitatively the right place. It could be this, but the mass totally doesn't work. If you want Sagittarius to have induced this, you need it to be about I think eight times 10 to the nine, which is significantly higher than the current estimated mass of Sagittarius, which I think is four times 10 to the eight. And while it's possible that mass estimate is a little bit wrong, it's hard to argue for it to being one and a half orders of magnitude wrong. So it's probably not what's going on. Similarly, we made a bunch of simulations designed to better reproduce the Milky Way Sagittarius system with former U of T grad student Morgan Bennett and Joe Bowie. And we found that despite sampling within the uncertainties of Sagittarius's orbit and a variety of models for the mass of the Milky Way and the satellite itself, that we couldn't get the degree of the response consistent uh, with current estimations of Sagittarius's mass. And even when we had got the right amplitude of the signal, we were getting the wrong asymmetry above and below the disk plane. So we all, basically the field is converging to think that is something else as well as Sagittarius, but from my perspective, it's still to some degree an open question. There could be things that we're missing. And so what's up? We don't know. It's a work in progress. Uh, for me, my next steps is to analyze these space barrels as a function of the orbital parameters to try and constrain the geometry, and also to fold in the information on the radial perturbations. I spent a bunch of time at the beginning of this talk talking about R versus V phi, and also highlighting that this, the phase spiral or snail uh, comes out pretty cleanly when colored by azimuthal velocity showing the sum connection. And this is because if you imagine your satellite is going past the disk, yes, it perturbs it vertically, but it's also going to pull it towards you radially. So you're going to induce some radial kinematic substructure and resulting phase mixing as well as the vertical ones. And theoretically, those perturbations should have happened at the same time. So if you can use constraints from both, it may be a good way to break some of the, the other degeneracies. And Thank you to all these collaborators. I realize I missed Axel, it's a bit late, but just in case. Um, and I know it's normally um, commonplace to leave you on my summary slide. I'm just gonna let you read that briefly. Gaia has revealed lots of disequilibrial features, which can be explained by bars, spiral arms, mergers, high resolution models, such as my simulation, let you explore the whole galaxy, no selection effects. I found the transition from breathing spirals to bending spirals in the Gaia DR3 data. And hopefully by tracking all of these, we can learn more about the nature of whatever interaction has caused them, whether Sag or its own structure. I'll um, leave you with another hypnotizing movie while you ask the rest of the movie. Shows on the left, the same one you saw before of Z versus VZ phase spirals. And now on the right, you have the R minus RG. So this is the deviation from the circular orbit versus VR. And these are also going to wind up and make a lot of fun substructure. So yeah, thanks. With that, I will take questions. Thank you, Jason, for this very interesting talk. And uh, now the floor is open for questions. Here you're dealing with one type of impulse. I think it's most likely we're not dealing with one type of impulse, but one type of impulse. It's yeah. certainly not resolved from my perspective, or as far as I'm aware, any of the other people working on this. I know, like we were talking during the Gaia sprint about whether the interaction of the satellite on the last passage could interact with the center of the galaxy in a way to generate the breathing mode. But I, I don't know. I remain unconvinced, but I, I'm comfortable standing here and saying, I don't know what that answer is, but I suspect it's more than one perturbation. Another way of asking the question is, um, you know, to what extent do we understand the normal modes of the galaxy? I mean, uh, you know, the, the ways in which it can ring. 
that's an excellent question. I think it would maybe be good to do some more work on simpler systems than my big many interaction model. It's like one thing we see, that's perfect. This is actually right after the first interaction. These phase spirals continue for like a couple of gig years before you have the next one. They ring a lot longer than my simple model of that spiral winding up should do. And so we've been discussing reasons that, that could be the case. One of our thoughts is that when the satellite comes in the first time, you excite um, long-lived modes in the halo, which can couple the disk substructure, which can keep them excited, which is one of the things that we're running our next series of tests to look specifically at that now. So there's kind of like two directions the research is going. One is trying to understand the phenomenology from simple cases, and the other is trying to directly unwind what we see today. Yeah. Dark. Sorry, dark matter halo, not the stellar halo. Yeah. Okay, and now we have a question from Reiner. Uh, yeah. Your model you're starting out with is, is by definition stable. The one I showed is very stable. For the yeah, dynamic is very stable. stable. Q parameter, uh, to make you for the disk, it's, it's very hot. It's 2.3, so it's not Milky Way like. This does affect some of the resulting substructure formation. We've run the same kind of test on a more Milky Way like galaxy. You get qualitatively all the same behavior, but you get um, a lot of other substructure forming as the disk does normal disk dynamics. So, this is kind of a laboratory for looking at the merger induced stuff. But yeah, the stars will react differently in such a hot disk to a truly Milky Way like disk. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Are you worried about all the so we have so we have a range of simulations that do this. I show this because this is the clean one, but we've looked in a variety of disk galaxies that are run with pretty reasonable mass and velocity dispersion profiles, and we never get the kind of um, what, like large scale one arm phase spiral distortion patterns that we see from like that are induced by the satellites in this case. The only times we found the phase spirals at all in um, more Milky Way like galaxies without a perturba have been pretty weak and temporary. Uh, I don't know if that fully answered, happy to chat. I, I, I don't know. One thing I'm confused if you speak of a one arm spiral and it looks there's something else. Is the interpretation of the yeah. model. The interpretation uh, of the uh, model. It should wind up if you want. 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 Particle simulation, you hit it once and you leave it alone. They all will wind up and disappear back into the mix of uh, being, yeah, back into full phase mixing. If you do it with soft gravity, the perturbations are different. They like the, because the stars that are out of equilibrio have gravity on each other. And so the evolution is more complicated than just that simple winding model that we put earlier. If the impulse is light enough, it can kind of behave as the, the test particle simulation and wind up quickly. But if it's quite disturbed, like it is in this case, as a large satellite, they don't mix away quite as simple as our, our little illustrated model. And that, that's also why I think the dark matter halo may be reinforcing the modes with some kind of coupling, but that's that's what we're looking at at the moment. Yeah, so just a uh, follow up on Ryan's question. I'm wondering, like, if the small perturbation, uh, the perturbator will leave their stars just in the disk, and how much of them will, how, what's the proportion of the stars that are actually from the perturbers? Uh, that's a good question. So, because of the orbit of this particular perturber, I don't think. Let's see, I guess I can flip back to to the morphological movie of this one. There's a lot. Because this one comes in for a pretty high angle, and so I think should have a pretty high vertical motion. But if you had a dwarf galaxy coming in closer to a planar merger, there may well be plenty of things that are left in the disk. But in this instance, the stuff that I was 
plotting in those big like spiral hypnotic movies are only the disc stars, not the ones from the Perturba. If you have a satellite galaxy merging kind of in motion with the plane, you could at well end up with streams of stars from the, the Perturba in the mix, but that's not what we have been looking at in these simulations. From the the remaining debris. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know the the fraction offhand, but it would be interesting to look at. Yeah, I guess all the mass that's been stripped from the dwarf is still going around somewhere, so it can still have a perturbative effect. And so, it's a good point. So we have a question from Peter Mark and the online audience. Peter. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, you were asked about uh, the gas content in the galaxy earlier. And the, I, I, there's not a lot of gas perhaps compared to the stars, but it's not negligible either. And gas, no. gas is dissipative, so it acts differently than these things that ring. So is there a way to study the effect of the gas on uh, these phenomena that you're looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one of the things we wanted to do is add gas to these models. So I have a two part answer to this. One, to get the kind of phase barrel resolutions so that you can really look at it, you need something on the order of this number of particles. So if I'm running the full SPH physics, it's really expensive. There have been people who've looked at it with cosmological simulations, which have real gas and the associated physics, but they're by necessity lower resolution. Um, they do make a bunch of phase barrels. The second part of the answer is our expectation, though we haven't checked it explicitly, is that the thin gas potential, which as you say is dissipative, will create like a thin little extra bit of potential along the mid plane, which will change how far down into the center of the phase barrels you can get the wrapping because it will be, the, the frequencies will change more immediately after you leave the gas layer. Whereas in the self-gravitating case, sorry, not the self-gravity, in the, the dry M-body case, you may notice that the center of my spirals do not go all the way in. Part of that we think is from the, the sub gravitational softening, but part probably because we're missing the thin uh, gas potential which should exist in the real galaxy. Can I add on? Yeah. Thank you. I want to add on to that question. Um, add on to that question. Um, more gas reach on the outskirts of the galaxy, and therefore the breathing mode is damped. For example, if the stars for up gas was you know forming most stars, and your perturbation is very early before those stars were formed out of the gas, then those stars will not show any breathing mode. That's an interesting question. I don't know. I would like to. I'd love to do a simulation that does include gas, but at the moment don't have the resources for it. But yeah, maybe that maybe that's true. I I don't know the answer. I have one question. I'm sorry. In your model, you bombard with a very massive satellite galaxy, right? So if you add up like much more realistic small galaxies, and then you can like introduce like all the uh, local galaxies. So I have not been able to get one that is so sufficiently close to the like the actual like Milky Way Sagittarius system that produces what we see in the disk. So soon it becomes sufficiently light to produce the degree of substructure that we see in the disk, which is one of the things that for me is the the mystery. But um, from my perspective, like some of the potential answers are that perhaps Sagittarius was significantly more massive when it came in, has just lost a lot of mass. So although you have your very light satellite today on its final couple of passages. It was significantly more massive and did a lot of this perturbation, which is still ringing and mixing and forming other clumps from self-gravity uh, up to the present day. But if I only start more recently with a light satellite, no, I do not make it. Uh, well, basically, the original mass was large. Basically, the the stripping of the mass is in principle. The stripping of the mass is in principle. I I agree, and it's just it's. I don't know, maybe other people have a better sense of it, but I don't know exactly what the mass stripping of SAD should be. And an interesting thing from this simulation, I ran two together, um, but the same satellite starting from the same place. This is taking Chauvin's dwarf. It was, this was only ever supposed to be my initial test, but I found it so interesting. I've been running with it for a while. 
I had two host galaxies, one that is warm and stable, this one, another one that was a bit, little bit more Milky Way, like more disk dominated, hit them both the same galaxy. And the outcome was completely different in terms of the satellite orbit. So part of this is because this is um, not super Milky Way like, but even when I've been trying to drop similar satellites into different Milky Way like hosts, they have all ended up with a variety of different orbits and different mass loss histories. So I'll be that if we so, I'll be that if we, but it's not a trivial thing to do to get those orbits going back all correctly over time, or you know the mass loss actually over time, or you know the mass loss history. Yeah. Well, there is no more questions. Okay. Uh, so we can thank Adrian again.